So let me actually start, I mean, before I get started in the session, are there any questions, because um, since we're recording, we might as well talk about dividends. Are there any questions about what we've done so far on dividends? Because dividends, as I said, in theory, should be your last decision as a company. It's whatever's left over that you pay out as dividends. But in practice, often companies decide what to pay in dividends and then reverse engineer how much they invest and how much they borrow. Terrible way to run companies, but unfortunately, that's the reality we face. So in this last phase, here's what I'd like to do. I talked about two bad reasons for paying dividends in the last session. Do you remember those two bad reasons were? Anybody want to remind me what are the two bad reasons for paying dividends? One was? Yes. Go ahead, Rukshan. Because everybody else is doing it? One is everybody else is doing it. I didn't even list that as a bad reason, but that's definitely a bad reason. The other is we had a really good year, so let's pay it out as dividends. What's wrong with that idea of just taking a good year, paying it out as dividends? Dividends are sticky. Dividends are sticky. Exactly. So if you decide to pay a lot in dividends because you had a really good year and next year you either have a bad year or you have great projects. Remember, you're a, you could be a growth company, not a very many projects this year. You've kind of returned the cash and now you've got to go out and raise cash and it's expensive. And the argument that your investors will reward you just because you pay a dividend, there's no basis for that. In fact, if there's any evidence in the market, it's that markets don't reward people, companies that pay out big dividends, they reward companies with big growth. So let's, today I want to talk, start by talking about three, three reasons for paying dividends. One good reason, one iffy reason, and one borderline immoral or unethical reason, right? So I've listed out three. Let's start with the good reasons. If the investors in your company are investors who like dividends, and we'll talk about what kinds of investors those might be, then perhaps the best thing for you to do is if you have the cash flows, return the cash flows in the form of dividends. That's called the clientele story. The second, and we've talked around this, is there are people who look at dividends as a signal. We'll talk about what dividends signal and why this is an iffy reason, because the signal that dividends send can be very much a function of what kind of company you're in. And I can tell you a story about how dividends can be a good signal, how dividends can be a bad signal, and how dividends can be an indifferent signal. And the third, the borderline immoral unethical reason, is sometimes stockholders pay themselves dividends because it's an easy way to rip off bondholders and lenders to the company. And you're going to see very quickly what I mean by that when I show you a graph of what happens to stock and bond prices when a company decides to pay a big dividend. So let's start with the first reason, the clientele effect. So about 50 years ago, there's a very old study. There were a couple of researchers, I think at Rochester, decided that they were going to look at dividend policy by looking at a company company called Citizens Utility. You know, it's an upstate New York utility, kind of an obscure company. But what made it different was this company had two classes of shares. Class A shares paid a cash dividend. So a dollar per share, they get a dollar per share. Class B shares got exactly the same dividend, but they got it in the form of stock. And they could convert their stock into Class A shares anytime they wanted. So in effect, what you were getting in this company was you could get two classes of shares, on one class of shares, you got a cash dividend. On the other class of shares, you got almost an equivalent price appreciation. So think about it. This is 1971. If you remember the graph from last week about the tax difference between dividends and capital gains, this is when dividends were taxed at a really high rate and capital gains were at a low rate. I'm giving you a choice between a class of shares where you get dividends and a class of shares where you get capital gains of an equivalent amount. So let me ask you a question without looking even at the graph. If you were to, based on what you, you know, if you think in terms of logic and you think in terms of taxes, which of these two class of shares should trade at a higher price? The class of shares where you get a dividend, where you get taxed at a higher rate, or class B shares where you get a capital gain, where you get taxed at a lower rate? Anybody? So you get a dividend or a capital gain, which would you rather get in a world where dividends get taxed at a higher rate? I would rather get class B. So does it, so everybody kind of agrees capital gains are better than dividends. You, so the people doing this research expected class B shares to trade at a premium. 
Now, one of the most interesting things that happens in research, it happens far too infrequently in my view, is when researchers go in with a point of view of what they expect to see, and they get a result that's the exact opposite. What these researchers found shocked them. In fact, I, had, I know the PhD students who actually helped them on this, and they were made to run the study three times to make sure there wasn't an error. What they found was that the class A shares consistently traded at a premium over the class B shares of about 10 to 15 percent. In other words, at least in this company, investors were willing to pay a premium to receive dividends even though they were taxed at a higher tax rate. And in case you believe that it's just these shareholders, there, there's an extended study that came out about 20 years later that looked at eight, eight or nine Canadian utilities that have exactly the same phenomenon as citizens utility. Two class of shares and in every single company, the dividend paying shares traded at a premium over the capital gain shares. The only way you can explain this is at least in these companies, the investors in these companies like dividends so much that they don't care about the tax disadvantage that they will pay a premium for dividend paying shares. So I'm gonna pause right there and ask you a question. What kinds of investors would prefer, I mean, this is a pretty big tax disadvantage, right? So what kinds of investors do you think would be the would be the investors who prefer cash dividends so much they're willing to pay a premium. I'll give you some choices. Older or younger investors? Alex, you said older. Tell me why. It's not ageism. So what is it about older investors that leads them to prefer cash dividends? They, they, they may be on a fixed income, so they prefer flexibility. Or consistency in terms of their payments for their living expenses? Excellent. I'm going to play the role of a pointy-headed academic and push back, and you tell me what's wrong with my pushback. I'd say, look, why do you need dividends? Why don't you just sell some of your shares? Because after all, you get price appreciation. Why don't you just sell two of your shares? What's, what's, what's the problem with my pushback? Why can't these older investors just sell a few shares and get the same cash? They may have um, been wedded to the shares or have grown to depend on that where they think that if they sell some of the shares and they like lose more of their future dividend payments if they're valuing the dividends more than any capital gains. Okay, that's, that's uh, in fact, but there's also a simpler reason. Remember that these are older investors. You don't own a million shares, you own a hundred shares maybe. So if you have to sell some shares, you might have to sell two shares. This is 1971. You try to, that's called an odd lot. When you try to sell an odd lot, they, they, there was no you know, Schwab online or E-Trade. You called your broker and said, I want to sell two shares. Your transactions cost would be through the roof. So if you're an older investor, you're a poorer investor, you're more likely to say, look, I like dividends. So one group of investors who like dividends are older, poorer investors. You know the other group that, that really want dividends is pension funds. You know why? What is it that about pension funds that leads them to prefer or want to buy dividend paying stocks? There are two aspects of pension funds that I think push them towards dividend paying stocks. What are those two aspects? They don't pay taxes, David, that's excellent. What, that's one reason, because if you're a pension fund since you don't pay taxes, you don't care about the tax disadvantage. And Rukshan says they have committed cash outflows. Absolutely. If you're a pension fund, you have liability streams, you need cash, you don't want to sell shares. So you get older, poorer investors and pension funds. And if the bulk of your investors are investors who look like that, guess what? You have a clientele that likes dividends. And if you pay dividends, you're going to get rewarded with higher stock prices. The clientele based story basically is that invest, you get the investors you deserve. So basically, if you're a company that pays big dividends, guess who buys your stock? People who like high dividends. If you're a company that never pays dividends, guess who buys your stock? People who don't care about dividends, don't like dividends. You attract a dividend clientele that likes your dividend policy, which means that once you get initiated into a dividend policy, it becomes very difficult to switch out. So the clientele-based explanation is, if you have investors who like dividends, then stick with it. In fact, there are studies that kind of back up that there's a clientele effect. And this, I mean, these studies basically is what they do. They look across all U.S. stocks, 
they look at how much the stock pays in dividends. So this is one example of a study. They look at your dividend yield. So that's a person, you know, dividends divided by stock price. And in this particular study, here's what they did. They looked at the dividend yield across companies and they looked to see what variables explain differences in dividend yields. And here's what they found. And with each one, tell me whether it makes sense. They found that higher beta stocks pay lower dividends. Does that make sense? Riskier companies pay lower dividends? Eh? Kind of makes sense, right? If you're risky, you don't want to have sticky dividends. They found that investors with uh, so companies with older investors pay higher dividends than companies with younger investors. A clientele story. They found that companies with wealthier investors pay lower dividends than companies with poorer investors. Again, that makes sense. Wealthier investors don't need cash from dividends to pay their rent or their you know property taxes. So wealthier investors, you pay lower dividends. And if taxes, ordinary, remember dividends were used to be taxed at the ordinary income tax rate, the bigger the tax disadvantage to dividends, the lower the dividend yields were across all companies. So there's substantial evidence that there is a dividend clientele effect. So here's what I want you to think about. It's a very subjective answer. Think about your company, right? Whatever company you've picked, say, what kind of investors hold my company? And in today's day and age, that doesn't even have to be completely subjective. You might be able to find the breakdown of investors in your company. And if 55% of your, of your investors are pension funds, I would expect your company to be paying much more dividends than if 55% of, of my investors are wealthy individuals who don't want dividends in the first place. So the clientele effect basically explains why you have the dividend policy that you do. Before I bulldoze on, any questions on the clientele effect? Because I'm going to now put you at the, at the top of a phone company. And you're going to see why I put you in the top of a phone company. And ask you a kind of a difficult question that every phone company's had to answer sometime in the last 30 years. But before I do that, I want to deal with any questions to, with the clientele effect. Okay, so let's, let me put you, in, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so like how uh, were you supposed to figure it out it's all it's, it'll be tough if all you have is just institutional it could be mutual funds it could be pension funds you really cannot then you just basically have to let it go my guess is that the easiest way to figure it out is look at your company's existing dividend policy right if you have high dividends my guess is your investors are older poorer pension funds you're right, many companies it might be difficult to do. That's why I said many companies is going to be a subjective judgment. And it's going to be driven more by what you observe, which is dividends, than what you cannot observe, which is the breakdown of, of your investor base. Okay. So now I'm going to make you the CEO of a phone company. Now I'll give you some history on phone companies. Where, you know, if you think about the, the oldest and most, you know, the, 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 the phone company that's been publicly listed the longest, it was AT&T, Marvell. For a long time, it was a monopoly. And so from 1916, I think through the early 1980s, AT&T was one company, it was a monopoly, it served the entire United States. And then the antitrust laws broke it up into multiple phone companies. You had, you know, phone companies then in each state and different phone companies. But phone companies historically have been big dividend paying companies. Why? Because by the time you got to the 60s or the 70s, there was no growth. These were mature companies that need the cash flows, they were regulated, the earnings were predictable. So they paid big dividends. And guess what happened? They attracted investors who liked big dividends. So in the 80s, when AT&T was broken up into multiple phone companies, each of the individual phone companies the, the, that were broken up, had an investor base that liked big dividends and they were paying them big dividends. Now you get to the 1990s, the business changes. Telecom is now a competitive business because technology has broken the monopoly down. So you're the CEO of a phone company, you realize your business has changed. You're no longer a regulated, safe business with very little reinvestment. You're a risky business with a lot more reinvestment. But you're paying big dividends. And you want to cut your dividends because you want to reinvest in these new businesses. So I'm going to give you some suggestions on things you could do. And I want you as a CEO to take a step. So here are your choices. As a CEO, you can courageously go in front of your stockholders and announce that you're going to cut dividends and invest in new markets. That's your choice one. The second is you can continue to pay the dividends that you used to and not invest in the new markets. 
The third is you can continue to pay the dividends you used to, make the investments in new markets, and issue new stock to cover the shortfall. Or maybe there's something else you could do. So any any ideas on what you would do? You're, you see a problem, right? You're a CEO of a phone company, you're paying these big dividends, you realize the business has changed under you, and you're trying to figure out how to bring your big dividends down, or how to kind of deal with this new business you're in. Any, 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 any ideas on what you could do? Let's say the courageously announced to your stockholders you plan to cut dividends. What do you think would happen? If you went in in front of your annual meeting of your stockholders and tell them, guys, I've been paying three dollars per share in dividends, and um, no, or and I'm I've decided to cut that to fifty cents because I have all these good projects today. You're doing the right thing, right? But if, what do you think is going to happen to you as a CEO if you make that announcement? Anybody? You're probably going to commit collective career suicide, right? Basically, A, your stockholders are going to go dump your stock, or it worse, they might take it out on you and say, how dare you do this? So, choice A might be the thing you can do intellectually, but in terms of practice, it's going to be very difficult. And here's the reason. Who's in that room when you make this announcement? Stockholders who love dividends. Tell, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to use this word later on as well. Stockholders love dividends. It's not going to be easy. They're, they're addicted to dividends. You tell them, look, I'm going to take your addiction away. Don't expect them to stand up and clap and say, you're doing the right thing. So A is off the table and almost no telecom company did that in the 90s. The second is you can continue to pay the dividends you used to and invest in new markets. And there were some telecom companies that did that. And guess what happened to them? They ended up not investing in cellular, not investing in the new businesses, and they've gotten squeezed. The third is to continue to pay the dividends you used to, make the investments in new markets, and issue new shares. Very few companies did this because they were scared about dilution. So you know what people did? They did a modified version of C. They continued to pay the dividends they used to, made the investments in new markets, and guess how they funded these investments? What did they do? Instead of issuing new stock, they borrowed money. And they drove themselves in the late 90s to the verge of disaster. So what I'm trying to say is one of the problems with dividend clientele is if your business changes, you could be in serious trouble because you're stuck with a dividend policy that reflects a different business. You know where this is coming next? Take utilities, especially power utilities. They pay big dividends. Why? Because they're regulated monopolies. That business is changing, has changed, as green energy comes in and technology opens up the business. What telecom faced in the late 90s, power utilities are going to face in the next decade. And there is one way, there are some very creative telecom companies that actually tried to have their cake and eat it too. You know what AT&T itself did to kind of deal with this problem that some of their businesses were technology? In the, late, in the, in the 90s, does anybody know what AT&T did? They actually spun off a portion of their business. It was called Lucent. Basically, they took their riskiest technology business. Remember, this was the dot-com boom. They spun it off and they created a portion of the company that was going to be in the riskier businesses and they offered their shareholders a choice of whether they wanted to stay in the old AT&T and receive dividends or switch to this new company Lucent which was going to be the technology portion of the business which would have no dividends. So there is a creative solution and maybe energy companies need to think about that when they think about how to shift clientele. So before I leave this part of the process, any questions on the dividend clientele effect, which um, you know, which which I can, you know, which I can address before we move to the next reason for paying dividends. Okay. Now, incidentally, the you know when we talk about dividend clientele, if you're a company that has never paid a dividend, you acquire a clientele of people who don't like dividends. So when you start dividends for the first time. There are going to be people who will dump your stock because why they don't want to pay taxes they don't like dividends so keep that in mind dividend clientele effects cut both ways you know when you want to cut dividends and increase dividends so now let's talk about the second reason for paying dividends it's an iffy reason 
And I'll explain in a minute why it's an FE raiser. It's a reason that, again, academics have offered that dividends are a signal. And here's the evidence that they used to back it up. Focus on companies that either increase dividends or decrease dividends, right? Companies do this all the time, increase or decrease dividends. So you go from a $2 dividend to two fifty. dollars that's a dividend increase. And focus on the announcement day. Remember we said the board of directors get together, gets together and announces a dividend. So the, the board of directors has announced that dividends are going to increase or decrease. So what these studies do is they look at what happens on the announcement day. So when companies decrease dividends, no surprise, you find that, the, that, that when companies decrease dividends, the stock price drops by roughly 5% across all dividend decrease. So these are hundreds of companies that cut dividends. The stock price drops about 5%. So dividend decreases on average are bad news for the market. When companies announce increases in dividends, the stock price increases, but only by about 1%. So I'm going to pause right there. Dividend decreases are bad news. Dividend increases are good news, but at least based on this, these studies, it looks like a dividend cut is much worse news than a dividend increase is good news. So can somebody explain the asymmetry or why is a dividend increase less good news than a dividend cut is bad news? What is it about dividends that makes a dividend cut? Go ahead, Rizwana. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Abhinav, go ahead. Or David. Go, David, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Does one show a lack of... Uh, a, a dividend increase shows a lack of NBB positive pro projects, so you start paying a dividend or increase it, whereas a dividend cut shows like, financial challenges. So you're saying a dividend increase is more... Uh, uh, there's a more mixed message and a dividend cut is always bad news. What if I told you that a dividend cut... I'm cutting dividends because I've created a, a better project. Why can't a dividend cut be just as much mixed news as a dividend increases? Because I can see what you're saying, but I don't see why dividend increases are alone mixed news. All dividend changes are mixed news, right? So what is it? You know, do you remember that graph I showed you about dividend changes last last session, where we looked at the number of companies that increased dividends versus the number that cut dividends? What do we see there? About five times as many companies increase dividends as cut dividends. Do you see where I'm going now? Dividend cuts happen far more infrequently than dividend increases. Even that last quarter of 2009, dividend increases outnumber dividend decreases. So part of this might be the news effect, but part of it also might be that dividend cuts are much rarer than dividend increases. So when you see a dividend cut, your reaction is, hey, things must be really falling apart. And that could partially at least explain this asymmetry. But I'm glad you brought up this point of mixed signals on dividend changes. Okay? So because it is true that I could tell a story about a dividend increase being bad news. And to tell the story, I'm going to draw on a different study. So this study actually looked at earnings growth around dividend initiations. This is the, when a company first starts dividends. So this is, if you look at time period one, that's the period in which dividends are initiated, this quarter. So these are the, the, the earnings growth rates leading into the, uh, into the dividend uh, initiation and the earnings growth rate after. So when do dividends get initiated? At the very peak of growth. But if you look at the growth after the dividend initiation, it tends to go down. So you think, so what? It turns out that when companies initiate dividends, it's almost a signal that earnings growth is going to come down in future periods. Do you see where I'm going? We think of dividend, dividends as good news, but I can give you a scenario where a company announces dividends and you say, really? Why are you paying dividends? I thought you were a growth company. I mean, I'll give you a very concrete example. How would you feel if Tesla announces next quarter that they're going to start paying dividends? It would freak me out. You know why? Because my story for Tesla as an investor is they're a growth company, they have all these great opportunities, and here they are announcing that they're going to pay dividends. I'm saying, if you're paying dividends, it must mean you don't have the growth opportunities that I did. So what I'm trying to say, and this is why it's an iffy reason, is you can tell a story about dividends where dividends are not good news, they're actually bad news. A dividend increase could signal that your projects are drying up. And in fact, there's another factor here. When you think about dividend changes as your way of 
telling markets about your future projects. It's a very inefficient way of doing this, right? Because you're you're inflicting pain on yourself to show the world, look, you know, I have such good projects and I'm going to show I have good projects by increasing dividends. And you could argue that 30 or 40 years ago, this might have been the only way in which companies could signal to markets. Remember, most companies and you know, analysts following them, there was no you know, public information you go to look up. So one of the things I'm going to show you is actually what's happened to the effect of dividends over time. So this study actually looks at how much dividend increases and decreases you know, affected prices between 1960, 19, early on, 1962 through 74, 75 through 87, and 88 through 2000. I wish I had an update, but I haven't seen any studies since. As you go through time, look at what's happening. Across the board, the nature of the effect hasn't changed. Dividend increases are still good news, dividend decreases are bad news, but the extent that they affect markets has decreased over time. And one of the reasons I think is you now have more information about markets. And once you have more information about companies, companies might not need to use dividends to signal as much as they did 30 or 40 years ago. Remember that graph I showed you about the shift towards buybacks? This might be the other reason why you've seen shifts towards buybacks. The signaling effect of dividends has dropped off. It's not disappeared as public information has become more available. And maybe that explains why dividends are having a lesser effect on prices. So here's the bottom line in signaling. It is true that dividends operate as signals, but it's also true that that signaling effect has decreased over time as public information has become more available to all investors. So before I leave, Rizwana, what the question or comment? Is there a signaling effect to buybacks, especially if you have institutional investors? It, you know, it depends, right? Because even institutional investors, so what's your pride? Do you think institutional investors want more dividends, want less dividends? Because I can tell you stories cutting both ways, depending on the institutional investor. I'm just curious that if a company has institutional investors and is doing buybacks, uh, is there a sig what is the signal is giving up to the market? Maybe there's no signal at all. Could, you know, sometimes, you know, remember the old saying, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a dividend is just we have too much cash, we're giving it back. And I think we over, to be quite honest, I, I think we overdo the signaling reasons. You know why we overdo it? Because it makes us look like experts. You know, a company announces a dividend cut. Let's say Exxon Mobil announced a dividend cut. You're going to get three experts come on see me say, the reason this is bad news, the stock price is down, is because there's a signaling effect. Really? Sometimes you just have, you know, you, you, you cut dividends because you don't have earnings. So I think we overdo the signaling story, to be quite honest. I think a lot of times when companies return cash, they return cash. There's nothing more to be read. But we try to read all these messages in because it makes us look, you know, as if we know more than we do. So I'll be quite honest. I think the signaling stories for both dividends and buybacks have faded fairly substantially over time. So when I look at a buyback or a dividend, my first reaction rather than a signal is let me look at the cash flows. Maybe there's a reason for it. But I can see why people want to build stories because we're as investors, we want to tell stories about why the stock price does what it does. You know? Any other questions, comments about the signaling story? Now, just as, a, just as an um, afterthought. You notice that I've never worn a suit to teach. I don't think I ever will. I don't think I've ever worn a suit in period. I burned my last suit. No, I think I've kept one suit just in case. You know, I have to go to a funeral or a wedding. No, but if you wonder why people make you dress in suits to come to an interview, I th I'll tell you my reasons. It's, it's, especially in the summer, right? You wear a suit, you gotta wear a tie. You know, it's incredibly uncomfortable. You know why they want you to do that? to signal to the interviewer that you really want this job. But the problem is it's becoming a cheap signal. Everybody can use it. So I think when you start thinking about signaling, almost everything we do in life, we think there's a signaling effect, what we wear, how we look. And I think companies often overemphasize the signaling aspects of their actions. They think people will read things into actions they really don't. So the dividend signaling argument is my iffy argument. Right? So basically, one good reason, the clientele, one iffy reason signal. Now let's get to the potentially immoral, amoral, 
reason for paying dividends. Think of what happens when you pay a dividend. Let's play a game. Let's assume you're a bondholder in a company and I'm a stockholder in a company. The company has 10 billion in cash. So I'm going to put the ball in your court. You're the bondholder. What do you want them to do with the cash? I'll give you three choices. They can return the cash, invest the cash, or hold on to the cash. As the bondholder, what works best for you? Nathan, you said hold, hold the cash. Uh, can you un my, uh, no, unmute yourself if you can? And So why as a bondholder would you rather have them hold the cash? As the bondholder, I want to have the surest uh, chance of me being paid out. And if they got it in the bank, that uh, feels best to me. If bondholders ran companies, they would never take projects. They just hold the cash, pay the bondholders, right? And absolutely. You don't, in fact, you don't even want them to invest because investing might give you cash flows in the future, but you'd rather have the cash right now. So if you're a bondholder, you can see why when a company pays a dividend, a stockholder might say, this is a great signal, the stock price might go up, but on the day, so these are actually studies that look as, remember that's uh, the signaling story, dividend increases cause the stock prices to go up. These studies also look at what happens to the bond price of the company on the day dividends get increased. And guess what? Bond prices drop while stock prices go up. You say, so what? Let's say you're the equity investors in a company, you run the company, you have big cash balances. One way you can essentially take advantage of your bondholders if they haven't constrained you is by paying yourself big dividends, buying back stock. So what, about if they, what did the bank, you know, banks used to do this in the old days. So when they lent money to companies, you know how they protected themselves against this? They put constraints on dividends. They said you cannot pay out more than 50% of your earnings in dividends. Over time, banks seem to have given up on these covenants and constraints. And who knows, this crisis might bring back those constraints and covenants. In fact, the U.S. government, as part of the condition for the bailouts, which are semi-loans to companies, you know what they've put in as a constraint is they've said no bailouts, I'm sorry, no buyouts until you pay this money back. And if you initiate dividends or increase dividends, you've got to get our permission. The banks actually had to do this after 2008. They were banned from buying back stock or increasing dividends without getting the permission of the government. And I think as a banker or a borrower, or I'm sorry, a lender, I can see why you want to put these constraints in. So you can see already this is, an, this is a, as I said, an amoral, probably an immoral reason for paying dividends because you're essentially taking advantage of your lenders. But your pushback might be, hey, they've been put in the covenants, why shouldn't I take advantage of them? So three reasons, the clientele effect I can understand, the signaling effect I'm gonna push back, the, I'm gonna rip off the bondholders, I'm gonna come back and say, do you really want to do this? Because you might want to go back and borrow money in the future. But those are three reasons why you might see companies pay dividends. Now to complete this part of the process, I also want to draw your attention to surveys that have been done of dividends where companies are asked, you know, why do you pay dividends? And they're asked about, you know, different. So these are statements of management beliefs. So I'm not saying this is right or wrong. This is what managers think about dividends. So first they were asked, does a firm's dividend payout ratio affect the price? Now managers said, yes, it affects the price, 61%. 33% said, no, it doesn't affect the price. 6% said, I have no idea. These are CFOs, so I have no idea. It's a very dangerous place, but no, that's, that's what, in fact, you get a consistent six to 10% that seem to have no idea. Dividend payments are a signal, 52% said yes, 41% said no. Market uses dividend announcements to assess firm value, 43% said yes, 51% said no, I didn't think so. Investors have different perceptions. So basically, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but this is what managers think about dividends. And you can see a very split verdict. CFOs don't seem to have a consensus on what dividends do to stock prices. And perhaps that's not surprisable because it's surprising because you know, academics don't seem to have a consensus either. So that is the lead in to dividend policy because here's what I'm going to do in this last segment on dividend policy. I want to talk about specific ways of assessing dividend policy. In other words, I want to be able to answer the question, is my company paying out too much or too little to its shareholders? Is it returning too much or too little? And I also want to be able to answer the question, and this is an indirect answer to the same question, how much cash is too much cash? Do you see what the question is? You know, you see a company with a cash balance of 20 billion. I'm saying, is that 
too much cash? Apple is a $250 billion cash balance. Is that too much cash? You might think the answer is obvious, $250 billion. Who needs that? It's too much. You're going to see that the answer to the question of does my company have too much cash is a pretty tricky one. So I want to embark on that process. So before I embark on that process, any final questions about the trade-off on dividends, the kind of lead-in, because now we're going to get into mechanics of assessing dividend policy. Okay, so let's talk about two ways in which you can assess dividend policy. One is what I'm going to call the cash trust nexus. You're saying, what the heck is that? You're going to see simply, it's this common sense way of assessing how much a company can return and then asking whether you trust managers enough that if they don't return that cash, you're okay with it. I'm going to argue that dividend policy rests on trust. To the degree that you trust managers, you're going to give them freedom on dividend policy. To the degree that you don't, you're going to push back. That's the first approach. The second approach is me tooism. How, how much should you pay in dividends? Well, that's easy. Look at what everybody else is doing. Latch on to it. Now, how much should I buy back? Just look at what everybody else is doing. The me too, which drives capital structure, also drives dividend policy. So let's start with the cash trust nexus. There are three questions I would ask whenever I look at a company to assess whether it's paying out too much or too little in dividends. The first question is a very simple and easy question to answer. How much did my company actually return last year, two years ago, three years ago? And not just in dividends, but also in buybacks. So this should be an easy question to answer, right? How much dividends? How much buybacks? Just tell me how much you've returned. And the answer to that question might be nothing for your company if your company has never bought back stock or never paid dividends. The second question step, I'm going to ask, how much could my company have returned? You say, how the heck are you going to answer that? It's actually a very easy question to answer. I'm going to argue that if you have the statement of cash flows for your company in front of you, I'm going to give you a metric you can measure that will tell you how much your company could have returned. I'm going to call it free cash flow to equity, but it's just a fancy word for how much could my company have returned. So step one, I look at what my company actually returned. Step two, I assess how much it could have returned. And step three, I'm going to ask, how much do I trust the management of the company? You say, how the heck am I going to answer that question? How do you develop trust in an individual or a group of people? It's based on their track record, right? If somebody has a history of screwing you over, you're not going to trust them. And the same thing applies with management. If I, when I ask you, how much do I trust them? Dashan, I'll, I'll, put, uh, I'll, I'll give you a chance in a minute. When I ask you, how much do I trust the management of the company? I'm going to look at your track record. I'm going to look at what kind of projects you've taken in the past, how well my stock has done. So how much have you returned? How much could you have returned? How much do I trust? Darshan, go ahead. Um, so basically what I understood was that uh, if you return all of your money, like if you return all of the free cash for the equity, you could be compromising on the road. No, 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 that's not true. No, no, wait. What's free cash for equity? It's whatever's left over after you reinvest what you need to. So if you're a high growth company and you have lots of great investments, what should your free cash or equity be? Okay, it'll be after CapEx is done. Exactly, right? Free cash or equity. There's a very, you know, I think the reason there's a confusion here, there's this very lazy definition of free cash flow that a lot of finance academics use that I don't like. You know what the definition of free cash flow is? It's net income plus depreciation. That's, that's not free cash flow. My definition of free cash flow at equity is whatever's left over after you've taken the investments you think you should take. And if you have a lot of positive net present value investments in your high growth company, I'm absolutely okay with the fact that you come back and say, hey, look guys, we have no free cash flow. In fact, we have negative free cash flow at equity. We need more equity from you. So in my, at least with my definition of cash flow, I'm not asking you to compromise on growth or investments because my free cash flow equity is after those investments. Okay. But you know when I push back is if your capex is in bad projects, then I might say, you know what? I prefer that you don't, not invest the money and give it back to me. And I'm on perfectly solid ground making that argument as a stockholder. So, any other questions? Okay, so now let's look at answering these questions. So, let's start with how much has my company actually returned? As I said, this should be the easy question to answer. So, I'll look at what I, uh, I so you know where you'll find this, right? So, if you want to find out how much your company has returned to stockholders in dividends and stock buybacks, 
Which financial statement should you go to? This is an easy one. So you're trying to find out how much your company is returned. Where would you find that information? Dividends are a cash outflow. Stock buybacks are a cash outflow. You're see, going to see them in the statement of cash flows. Under the financing portion of the statement of cash flows. So that's where I went. I went and looked up for my five companies how much they returned. So remember five public companies at least. So if you look at Disney in the five years leading into my analysis, they had returned $4.5 billion in the form of dividends, but $15.4 billion in buybacks, reflecting the shift towards buybacks you saw at US companies. Vale had returned $23.7 billion in dividends, $5.7 billion in buybacks. Tata Motors had $51.4 billion in dividends, and you can already see very little in buybacks. Baidu, no dividends, no buybacks. Deutsche Bank, almost all of its, in fact, all of the cash returned was in the form of dividends. In fact, German companies for a long time were banned from buying back stock. They were not allowed to buy back stock. Remember, a policy of not paying dividends is also a dividend policy. What I, the reason I'm saying it is some of you, for your companies, when you look at dividends and buybacks, will see zero and zero. Don't then jump to the conclusion, I don't have to do the dividend section. There are no dividends. You then have to examine whether the policy of not returning cash is the right one for your company. So first step in the process, just look at what your companies could have returned and that should be the easy part of the process. Any questions on this part? So you're going to find it in your statement of cash flows and some of your companies will do something really stupid. You know what I'm talking about? You go to the statement of cash flows, you'll see buybacks, no buyback, repurchase of our own stock. And right below it, you know what you'll also see? I said it was really stupid, but you'll see some companies do it. What will you see? You'll see issuance of new stock. You're saying, why would a company buy back stock and issue stock at the same time? Companies do stupid things. They buy back stock because everybody else is buying back stock. And then they discover that they're in the hole. So you know what they do? They issue stock. The only people who like this are investment banks that might make commissions from that but you'll often find both. And if you find both, take the net amount, which is if they buy back 100, billion, 100 million and they issue 25 million, it's a net buyback that you should be focusing on. So that's the first step. How much does my company actually? Here's the second step. You want to measure how much your company could have paid out. So I'm going to play again. Instead of thinking about a public company, think about a private business and you're the owner. You know what the free cash flow to equity is? It's a cash left in the till after you've met every conceivable need. So here's how you're going to compute it. You're going to start with net income. Why net income? Because you're an equity investor. Net income is your measure of income. So you start with that. You add back depreciation. Why? Well, for the same reason you added back depreciation in capital budgeting. It's a non-cash expense. You add back depreciation. Then you subtract out your capex, what you're reinvesting back in projects and R&D and whatever you need to grow. So you subtract out capex. So this was my point earlier with Darshan. If you have a lot of great projects, go take them. I'm not stopping you. And if you need working capital to put into your projects, you subtract out the change in working capital. What you get then is your free cash flow to equity before you've even factored in debt. You're saying, why would debt even play it? Let's assume you have a policy of raising some of your capex from debt. 25% of your capex comes from borrowing money. That reduces your equity need, right? So you add back any net new debt you issue because that's cash coming in. And if you have to repay debt, that's a cash outflow. And what you're left with at the end is your final free cash flow equity. Every single item that you see there comes out of the statement of cash flows. And in fact, if you want to think about a modified version of this, I think of it as net income. What you're putting back in the company, we call it reinvestment. And what you get in and out from debt is your net cash flow from debt. It's your free cash flow equity. Or if you want to consolidate it even more, I take all of those items, put it together, and I say, my free cash flow equity is my net income subtracted. And from that, I'm going to subtract out whatever reinvestment I make in the company from my equity. So my free cash flow equity is the cash left over after debt payments, after taxes, after reinvestment needs have been met. So let's make it easy. Let's assume you have a high growth company. 
you're doing, I don't know, pick your company, but you know, you're, you're doing Zoom, you're doing Uber. Let's do Zoom. What's the net income? Marginally positive or maybe even negative, right? So the company have lots of reinvestment needs? Absolutely, it's growing. So my free cash or equity for Zoom is going to be negative. My free cash or equity for Netflix is negative. So I'll ask you a very simple question. This is an easy one. How much cash should a company with negative free cash or equity choose to return? The answer is none, zero. You see, this is so obvious. Why are we even saying it? In a little while, I'm going to show you a table of how many companies around the world have negative free cash or equity and continue to pay dividends and buy back stock. We'll talk about perhaps some marginally good reasons why they might do it and some terrible reasons. But when you have negative free cash or equity and you see the company paying dividends or buying back stock, you already have a mismatch that you have to explain. So when you think about free cash or equity, think about this measure, not some half-assed measure where you add back depreciation and not subtract out capex. Incidentally, there's a shortcut you can use for companies where the leverage is stable. You know what I mean by leverage is stable? These are companies that have already decided that a certain percentage of their reinvestment is always gonna come from debt. Many companies have a target debt ratio. So this company has told you, 20% of our debt, of our reinvestment comes from debt. If you have a stable debt ratio, here's how you can compute free cash or equity. And this works only if leverage is stable. You start with net income, then you subtract out. Remember, 20% comes from debt, 80% of your net capex. Net capex is what you're reinvesting in long-term assets, and 80% of your change in working capital, because that's all you have to come up with as an equity investor. You come up with free cash or equity. Net income minus 80% of net capex minus 80% of change in working capital will give you free cash or equity. So I'll give you a very simple illustration of this later, but let's talk about computing this free cash or equity for a company. Right, so let's take Disney. Remember I showed you what they actually returned, about 4.6 billion in dividends, about 15 and a half billion in buybacks. Let's see if they could have afforded to do this. So what I did was I computed the free cash or equity for, for Disney between 2008 and 2012. What I try to do for firms is both computer free cash or equity before debt and after debt because I want to see how much of your free cash or equity is going to come from debt. Because the free cash or equity that comes from operations is a nice healthy free cash or equity. The free cash or equity that is added on with debt, I'm a little shakier on because that debt component might make me over level. So here's what you have. Pre-debt, their free cash or equity was 17.3 billion. So let me pause right there. Even before I counted debt inflows, the debt cash inflows and debt cash outflows, Disney had $17.3 billion in free cash or equity. Right? If I count in how much net cash flow they got from debt, Disney increased their debt by about 9.8 billion over the period. What I mean by increase is they repaid debt, they issued debt, but they issued a lot more debt than they repaid. So that's why they got an extra 9.8 billion. Add the two numbers together. Their overall free cash or equity with the debt cash flows counted in was about 27 billion. If I used a target debt ratio and I said, look, I'm not going to count what they actually did, they had about 18 billion debt. So if you look at their free cash or equity, I'm getting 17 billion if I don't count debt, 18 billion if I allow them to borrow at a debt ratio of like 15 or 20 percent, and 27 billion if I look at their actual debt. They actually returned about 19.9 .9 billion in debt. So my sense for Disney is they returned about a billion and a half more than they could have with the target debt ratio. But maybe you can explain it by the fact that they were trying to increase their debt ratio, which actually makes sense, right? Because remember, we found they were under levered. So I know this is kind of a, kind of a, a fuzzy answer, but when I look at D D you know, Disney's dividends and buybacks, I can see they're returning a lot. I can see why they're able to return a lot. And for the moment, at least, that's, that's all I'm going to draw as a conclusion. Later on, we'll come in and tie up the loose and say, does this, should Disney return more or less? But looking at the free cash flow equity is the first step in assessing dividend policy. So any questions on estimating free cash flow equity and what you can read out of it? So let me go back in time, 20, almost 25 years. I estimated the free cash flow equity for Microsoft in 96. This was when Microsoft was climbing up the market cap ranks 
because Microsoft became the largest market cap company in 2000. So their net income was 2.2 billion, their capex was 494 million, the depreciation was 480 million. Remember I said your reinvestment is in, in long-term assets is net capex? It looks like Microsoft is reinvesting almost nothing, right? The net capex is only 14 million. You know why that's a bit of a, that's a bit misleading? Now, what's Microsoft's biggest capex? In, if you think of capex as what you're investing for your long-term growth, what's Microsoft's biggest capex? R&D, right? And where is R&D usually found in an income statement? It's shown as part of operating expense. Their net income is already after their bigger biggest R&D. In the valuation class, you know, I make a big deal about capitalizing R&D, and you can see why. If I don't count R&D as capex, what I get as net capex doesn't really measure what they're truly reinvesting. But for the free cash flow equity, it doesn't make a big deal whether I capitalize or not, because ultimately, I'm looking at cash flows after reinvestment, and I'm starting with a net income that is already after that number. So I take the 2,176 million net capex, I subtract out the 14 million of net of, of I'm sorry, of net 2,176 in net income, I subtract out the 14 million net capex and then a $35 million change in working capital tiny, I come up with a free cash flow equity of 2,127 million. So what did we say free cash flow equity was? This is how much Microsoft could have returned to their stockholders in 1996. You know what they returned? They paid no dividends and they bought back no stock in that year. So I have a very simple mechanical question. If you have 2,127 million in free cash flow equity and you pay out nothing to your shareholders in dividends and you buy back no shares, where would I find this 2,127 million in Microsoft's balance sheet? And don't say retained earnings. You're looking at the wrong side of the balance sheet. It has to show up somewhere in the asset side. Where would I find the 2,127 million? Rami, you said cash, so help me out here. So, you know, let, uh, uh, can you unmute yourself because I'm, uh, let, I'm going to play devil's advocate and you can tell me why. So, why isn't it showing up in, uh, in, in, your, in your fixed assets or your capex? Well, given that they're not uh, spending it, so b because we're looking at it, at it, you know, uh, free cash flow to equity, after capex and changes in working capital it should already be the Ex residual cash exactly so your cash balance at microsoft in 1996 increased by 2.1 billion i tracked microsoft in 1997 why i was obsessed with microsoft because i hated it so much their free cash flow equity was 3 billion they paid out nothing so what happens in 98 i was in 97 the cash balance increased by another 3 billion 1998, they had a free cash rate equity of $5 billion. You're saying, why did the free cash rate equity jump? Every time Microsoft did a Windows upgrade, they got an extra $2 billion in cash flow. Nice business to be in. They returned nothing. The cash. So you see what's happening? In 96, the cash balance increased by $2 billion. 97 increased by another $3 billion. 98 increases by $5 billion. So each year they do it, their cash balance is getting bigger. By the time they got to 2000, they had a $50 billion cash balance. Sounds low in hindsight given some of the cash balance you see today, but in, nine, in 2000, that was the largest cash balance a company had ever accumulated. But you see where I'm going? When you see companies get big cash balances, people are sometimes surprised. How the hell did that happen? Hey, you know what? This is in manna from heaven. It's a direct consequence of your dividend policy year after year you pay out less than your free cash rate equity in dividends. Where does it go? It goes into your cash balance. If you get a chance, if you go to my blog and you check, I have a blog post where I track how Apple ended up. This was when Apple had 200 billion as a cash balance. And people were saying, how the heck did it get to 200 billion? I actually tracked out free cash rate equity and dividends and buybacks over time. And I looked at the change and I just incrementally added the change in and you have 200 billion. This isn't a surprise. When you see big cash balances, it's almost always going to be because your return of cash was well below what you could have paid out. So any questions on how free cash flows to equity and dividend policy connect to cash balance? The three are kind of connected together, right? Because if you tell me the free cash flow to equity for a company, 
You give me the dividends for a company, I can solve what your cash balance is. If you give me a cash balance in free cash flow equity, you can solve what you paid in dividends because the three are connected at the head. Siddharth, you said you expect them to invest short term to earn a return. You know, if it's cash, it has to be invested. Where does it have to be invested, Siddharth? It can't be invested even in bonds. It has to be T-bills or commercial paper, right? So, so you can see that the the cash balance effect of counting the interest, you're right, there will be an interest income that accumulates, but it's going to be a relatively small number, at least in the US and much of Europe. Maybe if you're in a high interest rate environment, the cash can also earn money and it builds up as well. So there you'd have to bring in the interest income on the cash to see what the cash balance will become over time. Yes, because the Indian companies do that a lot. Yeah. They have free cash. They just invested in markets. If markets is different because if you're investing in equities of other companies, then you're playing a portfolio management game, and that's a very dangerous game. Right? I'm talking about cash and and, equi- and marketable securities. So if you do that, and that's your justification for not paying me a dividend, is you want to invest in other companies? I'm going to push you on how good you're. So if you're a Warren Buffett and you want to do that, I'm okay with it. But if you're a company that's terrible at your investments, I want that cash back as an investor. Of course, in an Indian company, I might have no power to extract that cash. But you're right. Some Indian companies take cash balances and view it as having a portfolio that they can run on the side. That's you know that's that's a that's a dangerous game to play. So let's talk about free cash or equity for a bank. You're saying, how the heck am I going to do this for a bank? You're saying, why can't I do it for a bank? Well, think about it. To compute free cash or equity, I take net income, I subtract out net capex, right? Capex and depreciation, and I subtract out change in working capital. What's net capex for a bank? What's change in working capital for a bank? At some level, it's everything, it's nothing. It's almost impossible to compute the free cash or equity for a bank. So for a long time, I didn't even try to do this for banks. But starting in 2008, as you, can, you know, as I've probably said before, I, I've stopped trusting banks. I used to, pre-2008, I used to say, look, you know what, banks are run by sensible people. What they pay in dividends is what they can afford to. And then you hit, saw 2008 hit. And you saw banks continue to pay dividends in 2009. I said, that doesn't make sense. I need to compute what they can afford to pay out. So I'm going to give you my measure of free cash or equity for a bank. It starts with net income like the other measure. But instead of doing the net capex and changing working capital, I'm going to argue that what comprises reinvestment for a bank is how much they would need to reinvest in regulatory capital. You think, what does that even mean? If you're an under, if you're a bank which has a regulatory capital shortfall, you've got to invest a lot in regulatory capital. It takes money out of your net income. If you're a growing bank, you have to increase your regulatory capital. So the case of Deutsche, for instance, here's what I did. I took their net income which is I expect to turn positive next year, I subtracted out what they would need to reinvest in regulatory capital. And at least for Deutsche, because they're undercapitalized, they will need to reinvest a lot in regulatory capital. So you can see they need to reinvest 4.6 billion euros in regulatory capital. And when I subtract out that reinvestment in regulatory capital, I end up with a negative free cash flow equity. So in 2013, if Deutsche had asked, how much can we return? My response is, you can't return anything. You need new equity. You need 3.99 billion euros in new equity. In fact, I don't see you being able to return cash, even if you get back on a profitable trend line, because your regulatory capital has to be met first before you can get to free cash or equity. So what does this mean? If you're a well-capitalized, mature bank, I'm going to come up with a positive free cash flow equity and say, okay, you can return 70% of your earnings as dividends. If you're an undercapitalized mature bank, I might hold back and say, don't return cash because you need that cash to build up your regulatory capital. And if you're a growing bank, I might come back and say, look, your earnings are growing, but you might need all of that earnings and more reinvested back so that you can sustain that growth with higher regulatory capital. So free cash for for equity to a bank is a little trickier, but it can still be done. So I'll show you a table and then I'll open up for any questions about free cash for equity and dividends. So at the start of 2020, I broke down companies into groups. So let's start with the first group. So I took every publicly traded company in the world, I computed the free cash for equity and I looked at what they actually returned. So the first group are companies with free cash for equity that are positive. 
and don't pay dividends. So what's going to ha happen to these companies? They're big free cash flows equity. They don't pay dividends. They don't buy back stock. That, that's uh, and I look at the percent of companies in each market which are there. So these companies accumulate cash. Why? Because if you have free cash flow equity that is positive, and you don't return cash, that cash builds up as a cash balance. The second group of companies are companies with positive free cash flows equity, but they and they pay back. Dividend, they pay dividends or buyback stock, but that dividends and buybacks is less than your free cash flow equity. So these are, for instance, globally, 21% of companies are in this group. These are companies that also accumulate cash. Why? Because even though they're returning cash, they're returning less than they can afford to. So about 36% of companies globally I classified as cash accumulators. Why? Because they, they either are not paying dividends and they have positive free cash flow equity, or they're paying dividends, but those dividends are less than the free cash flow equity. So I put them in the green column because cash accumulators are safe. So green is safe. Let's go to the other, other end. You have companies with negative free cash flow equity. 11% of companies have negative free cash flow equity. And if you look across, 11% of Australian companies, but 24% of global companies have negative free cash flow equity, but, and they, pay no dividends and buybacks. At least these companies are doing the right thing. They have negative free cash or equity and they're not trying to return cash. They will have a cash drain. They will have to come up with cash because they still have negative free cash or equity, but at least they're not making the hole deeper by paying our dividends. But look at this group, 29% of companies have negative, uh, uh, this should be a negative, I'm sorry, make that greater than, less than. They have negative free cash or equity but they insist on paying dividends and buybacks. I'm sorry, no, 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 let me back up. They have negative free cash, uh, they have positive free cash flow equity, but they have dividends and buybacks that exceed free cash flow equity. Uh, so let me back up. So these are companies with positive free cash flow equity, so they can return cash, but they're returning even more than their free cash flow equity. That's 29% of my sample. These are companies that are paying out too much. So you could argue that the, that those investors are pissed, pissed off at United Airlines and American for doing buybacks or maybe even Boeing, maybe their argument should be not that they're doing buybacks, but they were doing too much in buybacks. And finally, of the companies that, you know, that if you look, if you look at the, the sample, 11% of companies have completely screwed this up because these are the companies that pay no dividends and are doing the right thing, but there are companies with negative free cash flows equity that insist on paying out dividends. No, and that's 24% of my sample. Since I screwed it all up, let me let me review that the, the red side at least. So the red side, here's what I have. 24% of companies have negative free cash flows equity, insist on paying dividends or buying back stock. They're making the hole deeper. About 29% of companies have positive free cash flow equity, but they're returning more than they can. They are digging a hole for themselves. And about 11.6% of companies have negative free cash flows equity, and at least they're doing the right thing and not making the hole deeper by paying dividends and buybacks. So I know I entirely screwed up the table, but go back and review the table. What I'm looking at is free cash flow equity, which is what you can pay out, and dividends and buybacks, which is what you actually pay out, and looking to see whether what you do makes sense. And some companies accumulate cash, 36% of companies are accumulating cash, 53% of companies are bringing down their cash balances, and 11.6% of companies basically are in a hole already, and at least they're not making the hole deeper. So any questions about free cash flows equity and cash return to stockholders? Um, yes, so out of these 100%, how many percent do you say are paying on an appropriate amount? Because it seems to me like yeah, if you look at, if you define, see, Jane, that's a good question. What did you define as an appropriate amount? What percentage of free cash flow is, would, would you say is appropriate? If, you're, if you say it's 100%, maybe 100% might be a little dangerous because free cash flow is equity in 2019 might be a peak year. So I, I think that we've got to hold off on that because this is where trust comes in. I don't expect the companies I invest in to return 100% of my free cash flow equity back. In fact, in some of my companies, I'm okay with only 50% being returned if I trust the company because with the cash. Because I, I've said, look, in some companies, I want them to accumulate cash. Why? Because they might need the cash to take great projects in the future. So at the moment, I'm not quite ready to say what an appropriate amount I would. So all you have at this stage, when you do the comparison, 
is a green flag or a red flag. What's it, what would be the red flag? You have a negative free cash flow equity, you have big cash return, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Or you see a huge positive free cash flow equity year after year and the company's not returning cash, you say, well, that doesn't make sense either. So maybe at this stage, all you get is a signal of whether you should dig a little deeper on the trust issue. But I don't think you want to pass judgment on, hey, this is the right dividend policy yet until you dig a little deeper. Go, Rizwana, go ahead. Um, my question is with regards to the second one. So your free cash flow is positive. Right. And you are uh, returning. Does the proportion of buyback to dividends matter at all? It does, right? If I'm returning, it, it, it matters for the, to the extent that if I return only 10% of my free cash flow equity, I'm building up my cash a lot more than if I'm returning 80%. So 10%, I'm pretty close to not returning money. So the, the wider the difference from 100%, the more you worry. So if a company is returning 107% of its free cash flow equity, you know, say, look, and it's returning more, but not that much more, but 170% is too much. If a company is returning 81% of its free cash flow equity, it's pretty close to 100%, but 8%, you're saying that's, big, that's a big difference. So the difference does matter, right? Because it tells you, yeah. The proportion of how it is returning through dividends uh, compared with buybacks, okay. does that matter? Yeah, I think it does and I'll tell you why. Dividends are sticky, buybacks are not. So if your free cash flow equity is volatile over time, I'd much rather that you do buybacks or flexible dividends than pay dividends. My worry with a lot of oil companies that pay big dividends is they're going to have a really tough time this year. You know why? because their earnings are going to drop, their free cash flow equity is going to be negative. The right thing for them to do is cut dividends. So why aren't they going to do it? Because they don't want to go in front of their stockholders who love dividends and say, I'm going to cut your dividends. I'd much rather that you have a flexible portion than you don't. So the, the thing that people are going to argue is the weak, weakness of buybacks, which is this year you're going to see buybacks drop by about 60 or 70 percent is what I think is its strength. I want cash return to drop in 2020. And unfortunately, when companies pay dividends, they're kind of stuck with those dividends and it makes it a much more dangerous game to play. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. No, Lexi says, what if the free cash flow equity varies from negative to positive? That's why we look across time. And that's why I did the aggregated number for Disney over five years rather than pass judgment on just last year. So if you're going to do this for your company, try to do it for three or five years at least. And if you can do it for 10, even better, you have capital IQ. You can download the data for as long as the company's existed. My suggestion with dividend is don't focus on just one year. You're going to get some very strange results. So don't, don't just look at 2019. Look between 2015 and 19. And that might give you a better sense of dividend policy than focusing on one year. Albert asks, would I, would I still prefer dividends to buybacks at inflated prices? That's a good point because when I buy back stock at inflated prices, Albert, do you want to unmute yourself? Because this is actually a very interesting point. Oh, you don't have a mic. When I buy back shares at inflated prices, you know what I do, right? What happens? I don't make the company worse off, but I transfer wealth from shareholders who used to be shareholders in my company to the shareholders who buy back shares, who leave the company. In other words, I punish the shareholders who are trusting loyal shareholders when I buy back shares at too high a price. That's why Berkshire Hathaway which for a long time Warren Buffett had said he'd never buy back stock in 2012 or 13. He finally said, we're going to buy back stock, but he introduced a constraint. He said, we'll buy back stock only if we think our shares are undervalued. Now, in most companies, if they said that my response is, how the hell would you know whether your stock is undervalued or not? Because most CFOs are incapable of valuing their own companies. But with Warren Buffett says that you say, okay, you know, so maybe, that should play in, but only if you think you can value your own company. Most companies, I think, are terrible judges on whether their companies are under or overvalued. No. Now, when Rukshan, Rukshan asks, how does a company... Rukshan, come back on, because uh, he asks, how does a company decide whom to buy back stock from? Actually, you don't. It's actually a, it's a, it's a tender offer. You don't selectively 
pick out shareholders because that will lead to all kinds of special deals. It's actually people who want to sell their shares back. And that's why when somebody complains in a company you know, that a company's bought back shares at too high a price and their shareholders in the company, you know what my response is? Why do you just sell your shares back? You always have that option. So it's not selective. It's actually open to anybody who wants to tender, tender their shares back. Chris, one need a follow-up question? Is your hand up from before? Oh, sorry, it's up from before. Okay. So there are no other questions. Let's, uh, let's move back to the slide. So when you don't return what you can afford to, as I said, your cash balance builds up. You think, what's the big deal? Sometimes when your cash balance builds up, you can become the target of some investors. So I'll give you a story. This was in 1994. Chrysler had built up a cash balance of about nine, of eight and a half billion. For those of you who don't remember the, or, or have never read the history of Chrysler, Chrysler almost went bankrupt in the no early 1980s. It was one of the first companies to be bailed out by the federal government. In fact, it got bailed out, it came back, you know, and by, 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 no, by, the by 1985, it had found its footing again, and it got a new CEO, a guy called Lee Iacocca. And Lee Iacocca came up with a product for Chrysler that changed um, American culture forever. You know what uh, Chrysler came up with in 1985 that both saved them as a company and made Leo Iacocca a legend? What is the product that Chrysler came up with? The Dodge Caravan, the original minivan. And as I said, it's changed American culture forever. And um, that, of course, allowed Chrysler to dig itself from a hole. So what I've done in this graph is graphed out Chrysler's cash balance from 1985 through 1994, but rather than just graph out the cash balance, here's what I did. I computed the free cash flow equity every year. So that's a white column and the dividends every year. Remember the difference between those just gets added to the cash balance. That's my new cash balance. So basically what I'm doing is every year I'm computing the free cash flow equity and dividends and taking the difference and computing what my cash balance will be every year. So you can see as you go through time, they've had some good years. There was a recession right there. I end up with about eight and a half billion in cash. And in 1994, Chrysler was targeted by an activist investor, a guy called Kirk Kerkorian. He was, I think, you know, a young 90, and he was maybe 85 years old already, but he targeted Chrysler. Why? Because he thought they had too much cash. So his, his so think of it as what Carl Icahn does with, does with companies right now. So Kerkorian goes to Chrysler and says, you have too much cash. And Chrysler says, no, we don't. We need the cash. You know what Chrysler's first defense for having a big cash balance was? We're a cyclical company that could be a recession. The problem with that argument was in the last recession, they needed cash, but they burned through about half a billion in cash. So let's set up an algebra problem. If you're a cyclical company and you need a half a billion in cash to get through a recession, how long uh, the recession lasts two years, how long will the next recession have to last for you to need eight and a half billion? You don't have to do the math. But it turns out that the next recession is to be a 34-year recession. So the, that argument didn't hold up because you could argue you're a cyclical company, but people said you don't need eight and a half billion. You might need a billion and a half or two billion. You know what Chrysler's second argument was for why they needed the big cash balance? They said we might have to do a big acquisition. That didn't go very, down very well with their stockholders. You know why, right? Because what's the history of big acquisitions? The target company wins, but the acquiring company shareholders usually lose out. So that didn't go, on, go down very well as well. So to cut a long story short, here's what happened. At the end of this fight, Chrysler had to give up. They had to return about half their cash, I think in the form of buybacks. But what I'm saying is often when you see companies forced to buy back stock, it's not just because they've built up a large cash balance. It's also because the activist investor can go to stockholders and say, you don't you know, this company doesn't have great projects. You know why that worked with Chrysler? Because the auto business is not a great business. So when they said, we want to do acquisitions and we want to grow, the response that stockholders had was, hey, we don't trust you to grow in this business. That's why when Google goes in front of the stockholders and says, look, trust us, we can find something with this $125 billion cash balance. It's on much stronger ground than when Ford goes and makes the same argument. One reason the airlines had such a tough time fighting off investors saying, why don't you return the cash? Is the business they're in is, a mar is at best a marginal business. You know what I mean, what I mean by marginal business? It barely earns its cost of capital. 
So when you think about when does a big cash balance get me into trouble, don't just think in terms of how big the cash balance is, but also think about what kind of business you're in. If you're in a bad business and you accumulate a lot of cash, you're much more likely to be targeted by investors saying, give the cash back. I might have lost you for a second there. So if you're, a bad, if you're in a bad business and you have a big cash balance, you're much more likely to be targeted to return the cash. So here's what I'd like you to do now that we've talked about how to assess cash. I want you to take your company, look at its statement of cash flows, perhaps for four or five years, and compute what the free cash flow equity is. Every single item here is in your statement of cash flows. Come up with your free cash flow equity and compare it to what the company actually paid back. As I said, when you do statement of cash flows, the sign changes already reflect the kind of cash flow. So your capex will already be a minus. So don't reverse the sign changes if you're using statements of cash flows to compute cash balances. So free cash flow equity is what you could have returned. Dividends and buybacks are what you actually return. See what that looks like for your company and where it falls in those categorizations we talked about. So I'm going to end this class with a framework you can use to assess your company's dividends. So let's say you've computed your free cash flow equity for your company. You've computed what they actually returned. One of three things is going to be true. Either your company is one of those very rare companies that returns roughly its free cash flow equity every year. Con Ed, I think, has a 97% return policy. It returns 97% of its free cash flow equity, but it's the exception. One or two things is going to be true for most of your companies. Either your company pays out too little in dividends. And how can you tell? Your free cash rate equity is much higher than your dividends and you have a big cash balance. Or your company pays out too much in dividends. If your company has paid out too little in dividends, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Do you trust the management of the company? You're saying, how would I form that judgment? Remember you looked at your company's projects. If your company is the kind of company that has taken good projects, its return on capital is greater than the cost of capital, and it has a positive Jensen Sapphire, stock has done well. Your company managers have done pretty well for you, right? They picked good projects, they've delivered good returns. Then I'm going to argue that you're going to be more likely to trust the management of the company and let them accumulate cash. So that's why with a Google or an Apple, I'm stepping back saying, you don't have a big cash balance, but you've done well for me. I'm not complaining, so hold on to the cash. If your company has a history of picking bad projects or delivering terrible returns, then I think you're on fairly solid ground saying, I don't trust you. Give me the cash back. Whether they do it on dividends, special dividends or buybacks, you don't care. You just want the cash to leave the company. So that's if your company has too little in dividends. If it pays out too much in dividends, again, I'm going to look at your past track record because if you have good projects and you're returning too much in dividends then I think you're doing double damage to yourself because if you have good projects and you give too much in dividends then I think or buybacks if you want to include so when I say dividends I'm also including buybacks then I think you're turning away good projects to return cash that's not great corporate finance you're rejecting good projects to return cash your value as a company will actually decrease but if you have bad projects and you're paying out too much in dividends then I have a real problem. Because if I just cut your dividends or allow you to cut dividends, I'm afraid you'll take more bad projects. When you have bad investments as a company, I want you to fix that problem first before you come to me and say, hey, can I cut your dividends? Because otherwise I don't trust you. So look at what your company returns versus what it could have. Then ask yourself, hey, does my company have good projects? Do I trust the management of the company? And if you trust the management, cut them some slack. Let them accumulate cash. But if you don't trust the management, you're on completely fair ground saying, look, I want my cash back. Companies don't have cash. They hold stockholders cash for them. And I think when stockholders say, I want the cash back, it's a company's obligation to explain why they shouldn't be returning the cash rather than it being the shareholder's obligation to be explaining why they should be getting the cash back. So that's why I said dividend policy is all about trust. So when we come back on when on next Monday, what I'm going to do is take you through this framework for my companies. But if you've tried this out in your companies, you can then ask me questions about, hey, I did this for my company and I found this. What do we do next? So we've laid the foundations for dividend policy assessment. And next session, we'll continue and complete this process. So any final questions before I sign off?
Professor, uh, yes. just like circling back to your uh, shareholder clientele, so could you in theory kind of shift your shareholder clientele by using like the buyback and reducing yes. dividend? Over and time you can, shares? right? Over time it can. It, it won't happen overnight. In fact, I'm going to give you the, uh, no, show you what happened at British Petroleum when we come back in, um, in, on, on Monday. When they cut dividends and how long it took them to actually get a new stake. It was ultimately the right thing for them to do. But the promise along the way, there were some casualties, including the, the incumbent managers. So the answer is yes, you could change your clientele, but it's going to be painful. The longer you put off doing it, the more painful it's going to be. Professor? Yes. Um, so I have a question. Uh, if you're already a dividend paying company, yeah. um, is there some is there some logic in shifting more towards buybacks than dividends because you get kind of a knock on effect where you're also reducing your future dividend payments by I think the logic would be that if you buy from business if you're a utility for instance, I would start shifting away from the big dividends because I know change is coming. I know my business is going to get more risky, more volatile. So if you see change coming to your business, you need to get ahead of it, right? So that's, I think, your job as a CEO, a CFO, is not just think about what can I afford to pay right now, but what's the world going to look like? So maybe with this crisis, a lot of companies will have to re-examine their basic business models. If you're a restaurant and you're paying big dividends, maybe this crisis might lead you to reassess those big dividends. You might not want to cut dividends right away, but you might want to freeze dividends and increasingly start shifting towards flexible dividends. If you don't like buybacks, special dividends if need be. So I think that you have to be proactive on this and get ahead of change. Otherwise, you're going to be caught in the vice that many of these companies are caught right now. Um, so I think kind of more specifically, my question would be, uh, if you have the, the option to increase um, dividends by, say, like, you know, $50 million, or you can increase buybacks by $50 million. Um, is there some, and you're already paying dividends, is there is there some logic behind going with the $50 million in buybacks? Because that could also, say, reduce a portion of the dividends that you end up having to pay out. So you you, you could, but less. some some of your stockholders are going to be pissed off because that $50 million in additional cash flow would have gone as increase in dividends. And I said, some people just like dividends. So you you get some pushback. The question is how much of a pushback and whether you can take it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Professor, can you also just do net income minus change in equity or free cash flow equity? In net income minus change in cash balance, not change in free cash flow equity. Is that what you mean? Um, Change in because the change in free cash flow equity is what shows up. Uh, the 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 difference between free cash flow equity and dividends is what shows up in your cash balance. Are you asking me whether I can take net income minus change in the cash balance and call that my free cash flow equity? I'm not clear what 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 would you get when you did when you do that. I think you would still get free cash flow equity. Yeah, but you'd also get the debt effect, right? So basically, you can do that, but you wouldn't get the, the free cash flow equity if you don't take out the dividends and buybacks because your change in cash balance already reflects the dividends and buybacks. So if you're going to do it, here's what you'd have to do. You'd have to take net income minus change in cash balance minus dividends minus buybacks will give you free cash flow equity. No other questions? Okay, so I'm going to wrap up and next section, session, as I said, I'll try this out in my companies, but um, I think you, you're ready to try it on your company. It's not, again, this is not difficult to do. It might require a little going through statements of cash flows, but with capital IQ, and that's, it's a 20, 30 minute job. So I would strongly recommend that you do your dividend assessment sooner rather than later and get it out of the way because we have like a week and a half left in, the, the, the class is winding down, so the nagging will increase, as I said, on the project because we need those numbers in and we need to, to be able to talk about the company. So that's it for today, and I will talk to you Monday. Take care.